My being cleaves to the dust. Give me life as befits your word. My ways I recounted and you answered me. Teach me your statutes. The way of your decrees let me grasp that I may dwell on your wonders. My being dissolves in anguish. Sustain me as befits your word. The way of lies remove from me, and in your teaching grant me grace. The way of trust I have chosen, your laws I have set before me. I have clung to your precepts, O Lord, do not shame me. On the way of your commands I run, for you make my heart capacious. Instruct me, Lord, in the way of your statutes, that I may keep it without fail. Give me insight that I may keep your teaching and observe it with a whole heart. Guide me on the track of your commands, for in it I delight. Incline my heart to your precepts and not to gain. Avert my eyes from seeing falsehood. Through your ways give me life. Fulfill for your servant your utterance, which is for those who fear you. Avert my disgrace that I feared, for your laws are good. Look, I have desired your decrees, and your bounty give me life. And let your favors befall me, Lord, your, re your rescue as befits your utterance, that I may give answer to those who taunt me, for I have trusted in your word. And do not take the least word of truth from my mouth, for I have hoped for your laws. And let me observe your teaching ways always forevermore. And let me walk about in an open space, for your decrees I have sought, and let me speak of your precepts before kings without being shamed. And let me delight in your commands that I have loved. And let me lift up my palms to your commands that I have loved and dwell on your statutes. So that's a, a, little, a little different than our translations. But it's, it's close. But every now and then it gives you a verb that kind of, oh, that kind of makes sense. Uh, historically important for Lutherans is Psalm 119. Um, 46, Psalm 119, 46, is the verse uh, that the Reformers uh, put at the beginning of uh, the Augsburg Confession when that was first published, and then our Books of Concord. Um, I will, I will uh, speak of your testimonies before kings, O Lord, and not be put to shame. Uh, that was talking about going before uh, the Holy Roman Emperor uh, when they were presenting the Augsburg Confession to him. Because um, that, was, that, that was, you know, a bold thing to do, and it was also a dangerous thing for them to do. Um, the Holy Roman Emperor, uh, even though the Holy Roman Emperor is an elected position at this time, uh, he really doesn't want to go ticking off the Pope. That, that's bad, because the Pope has the power to take people out of office, because he was both a secular ruler and the vicar of Christ on earth. Uh, so it was really bold for all of these lay people to go before the emperor and say, we're not listening to you, this is what we're going to do. And it was actually the lay people uh, that suggested that the only people who sign it be lay people, so there's not any pastor's names on it, because it had to be shown it was by the people. That was their decision to uh, promote the truth of the Bible. But enough about Reformation history. Okay, 17. So this third section, uh, section C, or however it's, uh, our Gimel is the Hebrew letter it's named for. Uh, this section is about, of course, the Word of God, as most of this psalm is, and the trials of life. So this, this kind of is applicable to all people of all times. And it starts out with a prayer. A prayer for God's blessing. You know, deal bountifully with your servant that I may live and keep your word. Um, you know, asking God to bless us uh, and at the same time coming humbly before the Lord and uh, you know, basically saying we're dependent on you for everything, just like a, a servant or a, a serf was fully dependent on the Lord for his land and for his crops and his livelihood. Uh, so are we before God. Pastor. Yes, ma'am. Is there a possibility you can turn the volume up a notch or two? Me? Yes. I'll try. I'll try. Wait, this is a much bigger room than the kitchen. That's yeah, true, isn't it? Okay. Um...
Yeah, it's interesting the way um, the psalmist writes this psalm, the way he asks for this blessing in this prayer. Uh, sometimes when we pray, you know, we ask for the things we want, but, but uh, and sometimes I'm going to say David wrote it, even though we don't know who wrote it. It's just kind of habit. Uh, so the author says, you know, uh, give me this blessing so that I may live and keep your word. Now, we don't always pray like that, do we? It's like, okay, I need you to uh, help me with this stuff that I need. And God expects us and wants us to pray for those things. But the psalmist is saying, well, bless me so that I can keep your word. That's kind of, kind of an intense statement, an intense request. You know, it's basically, uh, it would be like us praying the Ten Commandments and then saying, okay, help me keep these, which do we always, I mean, it's always there in the back of your mind, but do you, do you ever just flat out pray, help me to do this thing I can't do? Sometimes we'll do it with a certain specific sin that we're dealing with, but just to pray in general, hey, I need, I need help with all of your law, you know, so bless me so that I can, you know, make an attempt at this. It, that's not a prayer we're familiar with sometimes, I don't think. So it's interesting the way that the, the psalmist does this. But the, as far as the historical context is concerned, uh, the psalmist is asking for this blessing, for this ability to keep God's law because he's got pressures all around him, you know, and that's what kind of leads you to believe it's it's David that wrote it as a king. Uh, you know, there's persecution, there's trials, there's invading armies all the time. You know, there's always something trying to draw his, not his attention, but his devotion away from God. Uh, when you look at the history of God's people before David, uh, after David, but before David especially, you see, and after David, yeah, you know, you'll see how how many times did God's people turn away from God, right? And okay, so they're going for a while, all the way back to the Exodus. You know, they're okay, they're rescued from Egypt. They go out in the wilderness. They're wholly dependent on God, literally for anything, for food and drink and everything. And they still complain, and they still want to erect idols. Uh, and that pattern just keeps repeating, you know. And so here, as a king or whoever is writing this psalm, is saying, okay, I need you to bless me and make me steadfast in your law so that I don't repeat the mistakes of history of turning away from you and getting all of us in trouble. You know, so if you look at, uh, what is it, 22 and 23, uh, you know, take away reproach and contempt from me. How does Alter put that? 22 is, uh, yeah, take away from me scorn and disgrace for your precepts I have kept. Even when princes sat to scheme against me, your servant dwelled by your statutes. Now that's a little different. The verb tenses are a little different from what Alter does to what our translations have. Uh, you know, like the ESV, or I'm reading the NASB, uh, the verb there is an action verb of ongoing action, that this is happening now and is continuing to happen, mm -hmm. as opposed to uh, the way Alter translated it, uh, as if he's reminiscing. So it's like, even when princes sat to scheme against me, Lord, I dwelled in your statutes. I, I remained steadfast. Uh, and that little nuance is a little lost, I think, in our other English translations. That Because our translations we're familiar with make it sound like, oh, he prayed for this and he's good and he's doing this. Like right now, I, I'm not going to fall for what these other people are doing. You know, I'm, you have made me successful. Uh, and Alter's translation is more of a, you make me successful and you continue to keep me being successful. Uh, which is what they call a theological present. I know when they do it in Greek, Jesus uses it a lot. So it's the theological present, they call it, which means here's an action, and this action is an ongoing action. So like talking about baptism or regeneration in the New Testament, it's the action of this happened to you here, and it continues to happen to you all the time. It's not like something happened on a certain day and hour, 
It is, it's happened to you and continues to happen. Uh, which makes Scripture very interesting when you're aware of that and you notice how often it is actually worded that way. Let's see, where was I? And that, that phrase, where is it? The very first verse of this section, 17, deal bountifully with your servant that I may live and keep your word. Um, what do you think he means by live? Is that a spiritual life? Is that a, a, a secular life? What, what do you think that, that live means? What kind of living? That I may live and keep your word. Probably a little bit of both. Yeah, a little bit of both, right. Yeah. Right, so, so it is not only you know, that he would you know, follow his law and live eternally, but also that he may have a good quality of life here. Uh, so sometimes folks struggle with, you know, should I pray for things in, the, in my actual life when you're struggling with something like uh, unemployment, underemployment, which is a big issue a lot of times, but uh, especially right now with this uh, pandemic. Uh, but some people uh, get this notion that you shouldn't go to God with that stuff. It's like, oh, you should only go to God with like important things. Well, you know, having a roof over your head and food in your stomach is an important thing. Uh, it's not wrong to ask for those things. You can ask God for all things. Uh, and you know, the psalmist is asking for exactly that. So he's in the midst of all of these, this persecution in 22 and, was it 22 and 23, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, even though princes sit and talk against me, you know, I'm still meditating on your law. I am asking for a good quality of life, even in this circumstance. It also, it, uh, part of, you can see that in part of what he says, open my eyes and I can see the wondrous things from your law. That's the new King James Version. Right. And in, that is, I would say that that's the personal part. You know, just, and then why should, what do I do with this, with, with what I see in your word? You will sustain me as I go through this, you know, this position that you've put me in, mm-hmm. that I, I can't do it by myself. Either. Right. And if I keep your word because you said it, I'm expecting you to come through, God. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and especially uh, in, in Hebrew prayer, and in the Psalms, you'll, you'll see it often says, you know, God, remember your promises. Of course, God remembers his promises, but yeah, we're actually taught to pray boldly mm-hmm. and ask for bold things. Like, oh, you can't go, go to God and say this. Like, God, okay, you made a promise to us. God, you keep that promise. And, you know, it's like, you can't talk to God that way. Yeah, you can. He expects you to. You know, so that's why all our prayers, again, we've said this before, you know, all, of, all prayer, it has these demanding tone to it. You know, it's like, give. Not like, oh, please, uh, you know, if it's okay with you, could you, uh, like, take this headache away? It's like, God, take this headache away from me. That's, it's these bold demands, and that's exactly how he wants us to pray. That's exactly the way the Lord's Prayer that Jesus gave us is. Those are all, you know, bold uh, action verbs. Verse 22, in, uh, this is, remove from me reproach and content, for I have kept your testimonies. This is that's a new King Day version. Mm-hmm. So, you know, do that. You have to do that because I did this, you know. So I kind of want you to hold up here in the garden. Sure, and 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 it kind of is a, a circle. Actually, it's like, well, because of you, I'm able to do this, and because I'm able to do this, you need to keep keep doing it to me. <laughs> so you have that that kind of circle. Uh, so you look you look at the psalmist, and he is asking for big things. And then Spurgeon, there's a lot of in these notes Spurgeon quotes, even though his sermons are kind of hard to read, but he has some little one liners. Now and then, when he's talking about this section, he said that the psalmist is begging for a liberality of grace after the fashion of one who prayed, O Lord, thou must give me great mercy or no mercy, for little mercy will not serve me. So it's like, okay, God, it's all or nothing. You've got to take care of me 100% or don't take care of me at all because just a little isn't going to get it. 
And isn't that what Christ did for us? You know, it was, okay, I'm going to take on human flesh and I'm going to die for you, for all of you. And it wasn't halfway, because it, it reminds me of what we're reading in evening prayer, the uh, Apology of the Augsburg Confession, Article 5, on uh, sanctification and on the gospel. And it uh, constantly talks about how the reformers, Philip Melanchthon in particular, who wrote it, said that, uh, you know, nowhere in Scripture the, the Roman church was saying, oh, well, you know, Jesus, you know, the atonement was partial. He died for you, but then you got to do your part. You know, you got to do these works. And, and the apology in that article just for pages and pages and pages goes, show me where Scripture says that. Scripture does not say that. Yeah. Scripture says, okay, faith is a gift and you are justified by faith through grace for Christ's sake. Uh, period. It has nothing actually to do with your uh, motivation or your uh, momentum even. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a free gift. And because of that free gift, the good things flow from us because we can't help it. So even our good works are actually God's works through us. Um, and then, we're allowed to do those works because of Christ in us. Right, exactly. We're actually capable of doing it because of Christ, uh, not in spite of Christ, which is what that turns into. It's like, oh, if my works merit something, well, then in spite of Christ dying on the cross, you know, I'm, I'm doing my bit. Well, then why did he have to die on the cross in the first place? It, it nullifies the gospel. There's a sign on the church in Geneva that says, uh, good works are the fruit, not the root. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Which, what, yeah. what church is that? Is that at St. John's? Pardon? Is that at St. John's? I was, what, uh, no, uh, just the, um, the one next to the post office. Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> oh, okay, yeah. Yeah, so... Again, the this, this psalmist has all these problems and pressures, and he's getting it from all sides. And, okay, so he suffered. He knows what persecution is. He knows what uh, being deprived of blessings is like. Uh, he knows what it feels like to think that you're not getting what you need. So when we pray and then we don't think we're getting answered, even though maybe an answer we're not expecting... But he knows what it's like to be like that in prayer, that, that you just don't think you're getting the answer you want instead of the answer you need. Uh, he knows what it's like to be lonely and rejected and all these different things. My soul is crushed. I'm a stranger on the, on the earth. Uh, you know, I know you rebuke the arrogant and the cursed. You know, he knows that uh, those who wander from your commandments, he is not going to be happy with. And then continues to pray that I may live. You know, that theme is going to keep coming up over and over. And also that his eyes be open. So he understands, yeah, this is what it feels like to be persecuted. This is what it feels like to think your prayers aren't answering. But I know you answer them. Lord, open my eyes to see them. Right there in verse 18. So that we know, ah, yes, this is what we're doing. Uh, this is what God is doing to me, for me. And then, uh, then I can see. And take that today too. Oh yeah. In spite of all that's going on, Lord, open my eyes to see all your blessings, not just focus on the problems or what's going on, but to right. see all the blessings that we're given each and every day. That yeah, and I think sometimes we need the eyes opened to see the blessings that we have, even though even when we're undergoing a difficult time or persecution or trouble at work or, or family issues or whatever, and then we tend to dwell on that and ignore all the good we actually still have. Uh, and that's, that's kind of also, I want my eyes open so that I can remember, oh yeah, even among all this terrible stuff, you know, God's still taking care of me and I'm going to be okay. I'm going to be okay. One way or the other, you're always going to be okay. Uh, he either fixes it, it gets fixed for you here, or you go to eternity and you don't have to worry about it anymore, which is the ultimate fix, uh, the completion of the good work begun in us. Uh, then here's a, a couple of thoughts. Um, Wondrous things from your law. That's an interesting way of putting it. That uh, 
What first was that? Oh, yeah, 18 again. Um, you know, so that implies that not everyone sees the wonderful things in the law. You know, some people only see the angry judge. They only see commandments you have to keep that you can't, and so God's mad at me. Um, they don't see that. They lose sight of the gospel sometimes. That's what the struggle was with Luther uh, at the beginning of the Reformation. He only saw, and the people only saw, because they didn't hear the gospel, they only saw uh, God as the angry judge, and if they heard about Jesus, they saw him as a judge too. Uh, so it was like very difficult to... How did those poor people ever know that they were they had saving faith if that was the way they perceived God because that's the way they were taught. Uh, luckily, we don't see it that way, but I think sometimes in our human nature we tend toward that. Uh, but then when we do see it, when we do see the blessings in the law, the blessings of the law being the good works we can do for others that have nothing to do with ourselves, uh, that that's evidence of God's blessing. And... Uh, Jesus rejoiced about the revealed uh, wisdom of God, the revealed uh, hand of God on us. Uh, in Matthew eleven twenty five. he said, uh, At that time Jesus answered and said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and the prudent and have revealed them to babes. So that's one of those passages sometimes people go, um, Okay, so why is he making it hard for grown-ups? And it's like, well, that's not really what he's saying. He's saying that uh, a child can get the gospel. You know, a child understands, you know, give me, here, thank you, free. You know, I want it and you get it. And okay, that's, that's the way it works. We're the ones that have to put conditions on everything and, and make up stuff to make it more difficult, uh, obscuring the gospel again. And that... Uh, you know, we have a God-given gift of wonder to look at, to see unexpected things sometimes. You go, oh, wow, that's really neat. Or you see something in the news uh, in some place in the world that's extraordinary. And you go, oh, look at that. I never knew that was a place. Uh, you know, the hidden beauty or the obscure wonders that we can see in nature. Uh, and then God also gives us his word for that same sense of wonder which is maybe a little different way of putting it, but, um, you know, because reading Scripture, hearing Scripture gives us the Holy Spirit, uh, and which makes us alive in faith, uh, I don't think how, no matter how old we get, we're still going to have that sense of wonder sometimes reading the Bible. You're going to come to something and just go, wow, how did I never notice that before? It's like you make these connections and it doesn't matter how many years you study, how many, how you study it, how long you study it, you're always going to have those little revelations through your life. You're always going to go, neat, I never noticed that before. Oh, there's a connection I never saw before. Uh, so there's these unexpected beauties and wonders in God's word too, which the psalmist is, it's a continuous theme through all the psalms, but particularly this one. You know, as he keeps calling it the law, I, you know, I, I see the wonder in your law. I see the, uh, the benefit of keeping your law. It's, it's all about that. And, you know, sometimes it's enough. So, again, in these times of, of persecution and difficulty, the word is still there to find that sense of wonder and even in those hard times. And we sometimes, when life gets difficult, don't turn back to the Word. We turn outward to try to find a sense of wonder or a sense of distraction or what have you. Uh, so the great thing about this psalm is it always the psalmist is always turning himself back to God's Word, back to God's Word, uh, which is what we're called to do too, because that's the only way God reveals Himself to us today. You know, we don't have any real prophets walking around. We don't have a John the Baptist. All we have is the Word. And any, any revelation of God is going to come in those pages. <coughs> There's probably enough about that. Oh.
Okay, here. So I'm trying not to go. Got so many notes on this stuff will never move forward if I go through all of it. So sorry, I'm kind of tuning out for a second. Um, your testimonies also are my delight. They are my counselors. The last verse in this section. Uh, so whoever the psalmist is, um, it sure sounds like he's a king, though. Uh, okay, so he's delighting in God's law. He is trusting in God's word, but he is not trusting in the rulers of this world, the princes. Um, or count, uh, Yeah, princes, sometimes it uses that word. Um, yeah, well... While his enemies were taking counsel with each other, the psalmist is taking counsel with God's testimony. So he's like, okay, I've got all this noise buzzing around me, all these other, all these other men trying to lead, trying to do things, but I know where the only source of contentment is going to come from, and that comes from God's word. Uh, and that the word is his counselor, which, boy, I think our country was founded that way. <laughs> at the beginning, right? Um, say what do you want about the founding, founding fathers and what their religion actually was, because it's strange. Uh, but you know, it was based on God's word. And somewhere along the line, every society seems to lose sight of that. Uh, you know, every society has a, a, a canon of laws, right, including this country, Rome even, uh, Babylon, all the, all the great civilizations, they all have this law that looks remarkably like the Ten Commandments. You know, the, the basic ancient laws of society. Because that's written on our hearts. God's law is written on us. That's why even a child knows you don't steal stuff. You don't take things that aren't yours. You don't hurt people. You don't kill people. What have you. Uh, so this, this psalmist, this king, uh, knows that the only source of, of counsel, of good, wise counsel is the Bible, not the other guys that are buzzing around his head looking for his attention. Uh, and I didn't take a good note on who this guy is. I just have in parentheses bridges. Um, I think he was a commentator. Uh, was po pointed out that it's not a cursory reading of Scripture that uh, gives us holy delight or counsel. It has to be brought home to our own experiences and consulted on those trivial occasions of every day when unconscious of our need of divine direction, we're too often inclined to lean to our own counsel. That's kind of a, that's a pretty profound statement when you think about it because what happens when things are going well? We're not necessarily reading the Bible looking for counsel at that time. Uh, no, so this commentator said, yeah, it's no matter what is happening, this psalmist says that you turn back to the word, turn back to the word, turn back to the word uh, until you get tired of hearing it almost. Uh, and let's see. Kind of an interesting uh, Hebraism, if you want to call it that. Uh, so the beginning of the next section, verse 25, it says, My soul cleaves to the dust. Like, what does that mean? And they, it says that the... And keep in mind that each one of these sections is a prayer. So like if his soul is clinging to the dust, what does that mean? Uh, they're talking about uh, in that time, it would have meant talking about being near death or thinking about the place where the dead are, a place of death, like a, uh, you know, where you put the dead bodies, right? An ossuary or a, a crypt or what have you. Um, so the dust he's talking about is like graveyard dust or like, uh, when your bones turn to like ashes to ashes, dust to dust, right? So he's talking about uh, that he's feeling as though he's near death. He is, you know, his soul is cleaving to the dust, the dust of the graveyard. So he's feeling near to 
near to death, and he's asking to be revived. So this, this prayer is for a revival of the soul uh, that feels like it might be dying or possibly dead already. Um, revive me according to your word. So wherever you're down here at your bottom feeling, uh, asking God to restore you and bring you back up. Uh, but that verse ends with according to your word. So it's, again, there's that, that prayer, but also, you know, it's going to be God's will, not mine. But, you know, I want you to do this for me, but it's got to be your will that is done. Could it also be that he's feeling humiliated by his oppressors? I think so. I think so. I think he can also... He's lost in the mire. Yeah, I think there, there's that sense. And I think there's also a sense of feeling humiliated by his own weakness. Because hmm. I know that's a theme that runs throughout the Psalms that, you know, because we like to, you know, we like to help ourselves. The Lord helps those that help themselves. So it's, it's interesting that the, the psalmist can just lay it all out like that. It's like, okay, I feel humiliated. I'm assaulted on all sides, including in here, you know, in my brain that I am, I'm, you know, I'm just, I'm losing it. My faith is wandering and I need you to get me back on track. And it's interesting when, when sometimes when you talk to folks who say, well, you know, I, I think I'm not sure I have faith. You know, I'm worried about if I actually have faith. Do I really believe or not? And I always tell them that, yeah, if you're asking those kinds of questions, someone with faith would never ask that question. So, yeah, you, you might be struggling with something. You are maybe thinking your faith might be weak, but you don't have no faith. Because if you had no faith, you would not have asked that question. You wouldn't be concerned about your faith. So there's always, I don't think there's ever that hopelessness. I think if you lost your faith, you wouldn't care. You wouldn't be looking for it. You know, if you were concerned or you were searching, that means there's got to be some spark of faith there to do that because we're not capable of coming to God and, and asking for that without the Holy Spirit. Um, and again, it's his word then the psalmist is saying it's his word that does that for him and for us too because that's the only way God reveals himself to us. Um, so he knew what he needed. Uh, I guess the word revival has a different connotation nowadays. But um, Yeah, this is an interesting observation. It says that, um, again, still talking about verse 25, says, the psalmist knew what he needed. Uh, one would have thought that he would have asked for comfort or upraising, but he knew that these would come out of increased life, and therefore he sought that blessing which is the root of the rest. When a person is depressed in spirit, weak and bent toward the ground, the main thing is to increase his stamina and put more life into him than his spirit revives. Mm, yeah. Uh, it's a little, uh, a little reformed in its theology, I think, but uh, the thought is, is valid. Is that when you know, you know that only, only if your situation is lifted up that your spirits will also be lifted. I think that's talking about conscience more than actual uh, like saving faith. But... Okay, verses 26 and 27. Um, I've told of my ways and you have answered me. Teach me your statutes. Make me understand the way of your precepts so I will meditate on your wonders. And Alter had about the same thing. Yeah, I like the way he translates it. So, my ways I recounted and you answered me. Teach me your statutes, the way of your decrees. Let me grasp that I may dwell on your wonders. Uh, my being dissolves in anguish. Sustain me as befits your word. Um, so that is about um, confession. So this psalmist is telling God everything about us that God didn't actually already know, but uh, you know he is laying out to God everything about him. Um, 
and he's laying it all out there, which I, I look at that as, you might disagree, but I look at that as since God already knows everything about you, when you go to God in prayer and you lay it all out, you're saying, okay, hey, I've admitted this to myself finally. Okay, this, I know this is, this is it. Uh, I need help. Uh, but I'm not fooling myself. I'm not uh, pulling wool over my own eyes. I'm acknowledging, okay, here it is. Your law has convicted me and it has shown me my sin. And now I'm free. I've confessed it. So I've freely confessed it. And now uh, all of that's laid out. And then he looks for understanding instead of knowledge, which is neat. Uh, there's a difference there. You know, it's more than knowledge. And again, because we've been reading that one article in the Augsburg Confession, um, was talking about the reformers were talking about how just mere knowledge of what Christ has done is not faith, right? So, okay, I know Christ died on the cross and rose again, but that's not enough. That's not enough to just know these things happened. He said even the demons know that Christ did that, and they are not saved. You know, you still need the Holy Spirit. You still need that uh, faith. It's not that's not faith. It's just knowledge. Uh, and then the psalmist calls it understanding. So yeah, knowledge is good, but understanding is more good, gooder, whatever it. Uh, it is concerned with deep understanding, one that goes beyond a mere understanding of the words, which I think sometimes people that study theology, I think pastors can get guilty of that, is look at all the neat stuff I know that I read in this book, you know, ooh. But those are facts, you know, and that's, that's neat to gain deeper, to deeper understanding of the Bible through that, but that's all just facts. That's just being a, a walking encyclopedia of theology. Um, that doesn't save you, though. Um, but what the Word reveals to you about Christ is what does save you. Um, Are the words uh, in verse 26, and this is the New King Denver, teach me your statutes. Mm -hmm. In verse 27, make me understand the ways of your precepts. Are statutes and precepts, can they be interchangeable, or do they have two significantly different meanings? No, I think they're, I think they're interchangeable. Okay. Um, they use so many different words for law. In, in the Psalms, especially in this one, there's like, kind of cover that in one of the intro, many intros we had to the Psalm. Would they have, uh, you know, precepts, statutes, law, commandments, uh, observances, I think was another one. They have all these different synonyms for the law. Uh, yeah, if you want to see a, a further discussion of that, if you have the Lutheran Study Bible, page um, 9. 71 has a discussion of that. And it, it goes through the different words that are used in 119. And there's a lot of them. Yep, so we, you know, he's asking for, again, not, not knowledge of the law, but understanding of the law. <laughs> uh, yeah, I've confessed how I've broken your statutes. Now, will you give them to me again? Is the way Spurgeon phrased it. So it's like, okay, I broke your law, but give me the law anyway. Give me, give me back the law. Give me back the works. I guess that's more talking about the third use of the law. So the third use of the law is what does God pleasing life look like? It looks like the Ten Commandments kept properly. So, okay, I broke your law, but don't take the law away from me. Give me the law because that's how I know what to do that is uh, good in your eyes. So in, its way, in a way, it's praying for the Holy Spirit because otherwise we cannot grasp the law like that to, uh, to do good works. And then the way of... You know, verse 29, remove the false way from me and graciously grant me your law. Where'd I go? 29. Uh, 
The way Alter, I like the way Alter translated this line too. It's the way of lies removed from me and in your teaching grant me grace. That's substantially different from what our English has, but uh, you know, NASB has removed the false way from me and graciously grant me your law. But uh, yeah, I like that the way of the way of lies removed from me. Mm-hmm. I like that. Which isn't different than what our English translation says, remove the false way, but just the way of lies removed from me. That's got a, a more poetic, a little bit more poetic uh, feel to it, which since this is poetry, as well as being prayers, uh, it's kind of neat how he pulls it out. Uh, and then the way of trust I've chosen, your laws I have set before me. I've clung to your precepts. Lord, do not shame me. So remove from me the way of lying. I've chosen the way of truth. Or you've helped me choose the way of truth. Uh, that's the big temptation is to lie, to water down God's word, right? Um, I don't know, one of the big things, like I still think one of the biggest issues today is abortion. Um, you look at that, uh, how people twist that to their own advantage of what they want in life. So it's okay, it's just a clump of cells, it's not a baby, so I have the right to kill it. Uh, unless I'm in a traffic accident while I'm pregnant, and if, the, if I'm hurt and the baby is lost, all of a sudden it's a baby, uh, so that I get compensated for that. Uh, and not to make light of the tragedy of losing, losing a child when you're pregnant, but it's interesting how the same state can have a double standard about that. Um, California currently has that. So you can be charged for, if you kill a pregnant woman, uh, you can be charged for double homicide, but yet that baby's not a baby, but it's perfectly okay to kill it if the mother says it's okay to go do that. Uh, it's at the same stage of pregnancy, which is a huge double standard. Um, you can't have it both ways. Uh, so that's the way of lying. That, that's the way of turning the world, twisting the the world to our own uh, desires. Also, because um, the Psalms, or anybody who reads this, when it says, remove from me the way of lying, and grant me the law graciously, talking about themselves being left to their own devices. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Without any thought or consideration of God's word. Right. Right, because we want to make it all about ourselves. I mean, that's the easy way. And, you know, again, it kind of leads you to start thinking that maybe this was written by David, even though we don't know. But uh, look at, what is it, First Samuel 21, 2 and 8. Because David gets caught lying, like, a lot. So what is that? I don't remember exactly what that is. First Samuel, uh, First Samuel 21, 2, and 8. First Samuel what? Uh, verse Samuel 21, 2, and 8. So uh, David said to Ahimelech, the priest, the king has commissioned me with a matter he has said to me. Let no one know anything about the matter in which I am sending you and which I have commissioned to you. Did I got the right place? Okay. Uh, and that I directed uh, the young men to a certain place. And the, uh, did, why is this? What in the world did I pick this for? First Samuel 27, 8 and 10. I'm not sure exactly why I picked this passage, so ignore me. I Huh. I don't know. I probably had a point with that, but sorry about that. I don't know why I wrote that down. Oh, anyway, sorry about that. Uh, but this word graciously also, which is neat. Um, so you were... Thank mm-hmm. you. 
Yeah, 29. Remove the, remove the lies from me and graciously grant me your law. That word graciously uh, has a, a different... We don't have a word for it in English, I guess. But, and the, when they have to translate it as literally as they can. But it actually means as one, uh, the sense of one thing, graciously teach. So when it says grant me your law graciously, it means graciously teach me, graciously teach me your law. Uh, or I guess we could say reveal, you know, graciously reveal your law to me because we want to obscure it uh, in our sin. That's what, that's what sin is, is obscuring the law, ignoring the law. And then he says that your judgments are, you know, your judgments I have laid before me. Let's look the next verse, right? Uh, I've chosen the faithful way. I've placed your ordinances before me. Um, so how do we choose the way of truth? We have to, uh, we have to acknowledge the law. We have to acknowledge that we haven't kept the law. And then we kind of come full circle from starting in the dust, you know, being in the dust, being so low as to be in the graveyard dust, and then clinging, I cling to your testimonies, O Lord, don't put me to to shame. So instead of clinging to the dust, the psalmist is now clinging to the word. Uh, And it's kind of that clinging of, okay, I'm in a shipwreck and there's a plank going by and I'm going to drown if I don't float on that, hang onto that plank, I'm going to go under again. You know, it's that sense of I'm clinging to your law like a lifeline. And that, okay, now that I've, I've ripped, I've grasped that lifeline and now I will, uh, I will not be put to shame because you have, God has rescued us. Um, it reminds me of what uh, Katarina von Bora Luther Luther's life, wife, life, wife uh, said uh, near the end of her life, uh, she said that uh, I will cling to Christ as a burr to a coat. So like when you, you know, when you go out walking and you get one of those cockle burrs on you and you just, sometimes you can't get them things off, right? So she compared her faith to that as I'm going to cling to Christ like a, like a burr clings to a coat. Uh, Sometimes I think she should have wrote more because you know, she had a kind of nice way with words too sometimes. Um, and then this idea of enlarging your heart. I will run the way of your commandments for you will enlarge my heart. Um, so not only, you know, not only do we have to have that sense of, okay, I'm going to cling to God's word because God's word is great. It has all the revelation we need of how to be, you know, how to be content in this life and how to be assured that we have the life to come. Uh, But now you've also, not only are you clinging to that law, but you're also, the scales are off your eyes, right? We, we, We now see that we have to depend on God when we depend on us, ourselves, we're in trouble. That's when we ignore the word. Uh, And so now, he prays that his heart be enlarged, that his heart be bigger, it be stronger, uh, better than it was before, more steadfast to continue clinging to that law. Uh, kind of asking for insurance against falling again or, or loosening his grip on it again. Yeah, that's about... So it's asking for God's help in keeping the commandments. I mean, that's the oh, yeah. bottom yeah. line of what he's doing. It's like, do this for me so I can more follow your commandments. Yeah, I, I look at like each one of these prayers. I kind of am starting to see a pattern of the actual the liturgy in it. Um, uh, so, you, you know, the service begins with the invocation of, you know, God's name, and then we go right into confession. Usually, you know, you have confession, you have absolution. Uh, prayer, Lord's Supper, and then the dismissal in general terms. Uh, so, you know, you kind of see that same pattern here. The psalmist comes and goes, okay, I have to acknowledge my sin before God, right, confession. 
and then you know then you ask for absolution and then you continue on and you see okay this is how you remain strong so it's okay we come to church we confess sins we receive absolution we hear the gospel we receive the sacrament so they're hearing the gospel and receiving the sacrament that's where the psalmist is asking for being strengthened to remain steadfast that's how god makes us steadfast he gives us the word and the sacraments i just did the pastor matsky thing it's cool pastor matsky always used to whenever he was talking uh, in a sermon he talks about the means of grace the hands came out like that the means of grace (laughs) i just did it uh yeah so you confess your sins, you're absolved of your sins, then you acknowledge the gifts God gives you to rem- keep you strong. So it's just like the same outline the psalmist is uh, using in these prayers is what we do in worship. So, okay, now I receive the Lord's Supper. I receive the, you know, the inoculation against the world, which I just confessed is my problem. Me and all of that out there is what makes me lose focus on what is right. But he, God gives me the medicine of eternal life to go back out there and now I'm prepared to say, I love your law, I'm going to live your law, I'm going to keep your commandments. Till next Sunday, <laughs> we have to repeat the cycle because we're still humans. But it's that same, that same pattern we see in our liturgy, we see in these prayers, which is kind of neat. Uh, okay, so this next section that begins in 33, we are going kind of quick, but... How more sections are there? There's 22 sections, so we got you know a long way to go. And then the sixth session starts the same way. Teach me, O Lord, the way of your statutes, and I will observe it to the end. So it gives a little bit different way of saying it. Um, teach me your statutes, and I'll be on. I'm on it. I am going to keep it till the end. Uh, instruct me, Lord, in the way of your statutes, that I may keep it without fail. Um, and that is a little different, again, that's a little different action with the verbs that I like the way Alter quotes it sometimes better than our English translation. So it says, teach me, O Lord, the way of your statutes, and I shall observe it to the end. Alter, uh, Alter translates that as, instruct me, Lord, in the way of your statutes, that I may keep it without fail. It's just a little bit, a little bit different. Um, I don't know, maybe I try to make too much nuance out of this guy's translation, but I just, I think his language is sometimes simpler. That's just me. You know, then the next verse, give me insight that I may keep your teaching and observe it with a whole heart. Um, give me understanding that I may obey your law. It is, it's the, kind of the same. I mean, it can't be that different. Uh, you know, keep it with all my heart, it says, or observe it with a whole heart. Guide me on the track of your commandments, for in it I delight. Oh. That's a hard thing to do. You know, if you, if, if you went out and surveyed a hundred people and say, hey, do you delight in the Ten Commandments? I want, people are going to look at you like you're nuts. I, sometimes I think that would be fun to just go out on a street corner somewhere. Of course, then there would be, oh, there's one of those crazy religious mm-hmm. people. Like, excuse me, you know, do you acknowledge that, you know, God gave us the Ten Commandments? Yeah, so do you delight in the Ten Commandments? Like, what's wrong with you? Go away, crazy person. How do you, how do you delight in the commandments? But Delight in keeping them? I don't know. Yeah, how we do, how, how are you doing with that? I know how I'm doing with that. That's not good. Um, okay, but... You have the sense of he delights in the law. The psalmists always say that. I delight in the law of the Lord, but I know I can't walk in it alone. You know, so there's always that, yeah, I like this stuff, but. And then there's the confession again. You know, I have to confess, I don't. Um, it's kind of like a, a child, right? When they're first starting to learn to walk and you've got to like run around behind them with a pillow or something because... They might get up two steps, and if they get going real fast, they'll keep going until, oh, no, momentum, I'm going to face plant, right? You know, just like we did learning how to walk is the same thing in the Christian life. is okay, you know, we finally start to learn to walk, um, and then we fall down, and then we learn to run, and then when we fall down, we fall down harder, uh, and then we learn to ride a bike, and then we learn how to fall off a bike, uh, then we learn how to drive, and then you learn how to crash the car, 
Uh, some people do, some people never get in an accident, but uh, we go through all these stages of life, but it's the same pattern. I learn how to do it, and I have to do it slow, and then I do it faster, and then I think I've got it, and then I get in trouble. I screw it up. No different than what we do with the loss. We get older, it's like, oh yeah, you know, I'm, I'm conscious of all the stuff I do that is sinful. Yay, I feel so much better about that. It was easier when I was ignorant. But that is our maturation as Christians. It's not so much that we become so holy. We, we grow in sanctification. That, that is actually a thing the Bible teaches us. We're supposed to get better. Uh, but when you make that your focus, you kind of make that your God, and it can turn into idolatry. But, uh, but we, try to, uh, we try to sin less, but as we get older and more mature, we realize... Yeah, wow, I really am a sinner. I mean, I'm acknowledging I didn't even think about that. That's actually kind of sinful. That's, wow, I am such a worm. I need, boom, confession and absolution again. Uh, I honestly think that's what ma- being a mature Christian is. It's just being able to admit, yeah, yeah, I sin all the time. You know, it's not good. Uh, and I, you, you, you learn better and better as we get older just how much you need God's grace. Uh, there's that arrogance of youth. I think we all have. Uh, some of us let go of it later than others, but you know, you go from that I'm indestructible to uh, yeah, there's something missing in my life. Maybe I should go back to church. And then to hey, I'm a pretty good person, and realize no, yeah. As we grow in awareness of our sinfulness, we should continue to grow even faster or deeper mm. in the knowledge of His mercy and grace. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think that's what the psalmist here in this section is talking about. He wants to get that deeper walk, deeper knowledge, yeah. closer to God. And when it says, incline my heart to your testimonies, it's, he realizes that his love for the Lord has its source in God Himself. Right, right. Yeah, it's, you know, as we learn that, you know, even our love of God comes from God and not us. Uh, it's just interesting that he talks about, turn away my eyes from looking at vanity. You know, and I'm just start thinking, you know, you can almost think of Solomon writing this, actually. Maybe, again, we don't know who wrote it, but, uh, but just when you, when you talk about, you know, Proverbs, you know, wisdom personified as a woman, which is kind of neat, you know, that uh, you know, wisdom is, is a good thing, but but it's all vanity, as the the writer of Proverbs, whether well, Solomon wrote in Proverbs, vanity of vanities, all is vanity. Uh, everything, and it, it's interesting just to see there's this king that has everything, including the double dose of wisdom because he asked for it and received it, and then like a thousand wives. Some people say two thousand wives. How do you have time for that? How do you? How would you, why would you want a thousand women mad at you all the time? That's what I don't understand. <laughs> but yeah, so Solomon had it all, but he had that, that bit of wisdom that's true. It's like, wow, all, it's all vanity. And you just see that when you see the word vanity here. Turn away my eyes from looking at this vanity and revive me. There's that word revival again. Uh, so I I think that's talking about um, covetousness, because that's that's one of our big things that we do. We covet, especially as Americans, we're really good at coveting. We got the I wants, <laughs> really bad. Uh, but we see how many times, even in the Old Testament, you've got Balaam, and you've got Ahab was murdered for. Uh, being for covetousness, David and his whole uh, thing with uh, Bathsheba, um, you know, Achan uh, brought Israel to ruin because of his covetousness. Judas, his betrayal of Christ, that was covetousness in the bottom line: money, greed. Uh, Gehazi, uh, Ananias. There, the list through Scripture of of people who were coveting things they shouldn't is long, uh, probably because we see in Scripture what being human is, because it applies to us today, too, maybe more so. 
So he says, turn our eyes away from that stuff that some things are worthless. Some things have no value. We may put a lot of value on it here in our lives, but ultimately they're empty of value uh, for eternity. Right? So do, you need, do I need the latest you know, phone or computer? No, I don't. I didn't want it because it's fun. Uh, but it's one of those empty things. It's not helping me live my life better. And it's not helping me love my neighbor better. Uh, and, and sometimes it's not saying having stuff or new stuff is bad. Don't get me wrong. I just sometimes, you know, our eyes stick to the stuff we want instead of the stuff that's already in front of us that we have and ignore, like, the word, the law, which is what the psalmist is going for. So, you know, the psalmist is asking for his eyes to be turned away from this worthless stuff and get our hearts and minds on board with the things that matter. Now, when you really think about it, you, know, you think about Paul, because that's come up in, in the lectionary and in our daily prayer readings lately. Uh, you know, for me to die, for me to live as Christ, and, right? And to die as gain. And when he, talks, when he talks about, okay, the new life, the regenerated life in Christ is when you die to self. And we're real good. I'm real good about preaching about dying to yourself. But what does that really mean? Dying to myself means I spend my every waking moment working for the benefit of my neighbor. Boy, I don't do that. <laughs> you know? That's hard. That's hard to say, okay, I'm going to live my entire life. And you can see how you can turn yourself into knots over guilt, too. If you try to say, okay, I'm trying to live my life for everybody else, but oh, you know, I took some time to you know, like read a book or do something on my own. It, it, again, you can turn it into idolatry, trying to say, oh, well, yeah, I'm failing at this. We can, all things in moderation, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Uh, but if we're really, if you read it to the letter, well, it's like, I suppose if we could do that, then we wouldn't need Christ. We would be able to keep the law perfectly if we could actually do that, but we can't. Uh, all things are permissible and all things are beneficial. Right, right. One thing, when I look at that too, uh, he starts out, uh, well, uh, verse 34, give me understanding and that I shall keep your law in me and I shall observe it with my whole heart. Then he comes down to his eyes, you know, turn my eyes away from merciless things. So we have our heart, our eyes, and eyes being, as we have been taught, them, limited to the soul. Mm -hmm. So if we get my heart and the soul together, then, you know, we we we're good. And the verb, the, uh, I guess the verb is very chicken chicken. And that, from 33 to uh, 38, teach me, give me understanding, mm -hmm. make me walk, incline my heart, turn my eyes away, provide me, establish me. Those, you know, it's, it's almost like more, as you read through the whole song, but it, 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 it's, it's more intense. Mm -hmm. you know, and it's mm -hmm. getting more intense than what. Yeah, you do see that. Like it, it's just it's starting to intensify. Sure, I'm losing my mind. Um, somebody look up Job thirty-one one for me, and then I'll look up Numbers fifteen. Job what? Uh, Job thirty-one one. One. Thirty-one one. Yeah. I have made a covenant with my eyes. How then could I gaze at a virgin? What would be my portion from God above and my heritage from the Almighty on high? Is not calamity for the unrighteous and disaster for the workers of iniquity? Does not he see my ways and the number of my steps? I have walked with falsehood and my foot has hastened to deceit. Let me be weighed in just balance and let God know my integrity. If my step has turned aside... How, 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 what verse are you on now? I'm sorry. Just verse 1. Oh. Yeah, so do verse 1 again. I'm so sorry. It's all right. It's like, wait, that's a long verse. Covenant with my eyes, how then could I gaze at a virgin? Okay. And then Numbers 15.39 says... And I just lost it. 39. Uh... Actually, I got back up. Back up. It is here. He was giving uh, the laws uh, for 
uh, Sabbath breaking and several other things here in Numbers. And then the Lord spoke to Moses saying, speak to the sons of Israel and tell them they shall make for themselves tassels on the corners of their garments throughout their generations and that they shall put on the tassel of each corner a cord of blue. It shall be a tassel for you to look at and remember all the commandments of the Lord so as to do them and not follow after your own heart and your own eyes after which you played the harlot. Uh, so the people of Israel playing the harlot is going chasing after false gods. And you'll see the Orthodox Jews do that to their, this day with, their, with the prayer shawls and then uh, you know, the tassels so they can always see it. Uh, and then they do the things called a teufel, where they'll put it on their arm, and it winds on their arm with a thong, and it's got a Bible passage inside, and then there's one they put on their forehead, and they'll tie it on. Uh, which is, it's going back to that passage, I, the law of the Lord is always before my eyes. So that's why it's like that. Um, right, so they're talking about uh, the eye can lead the heart. So keeping, the, keeping your eyes on what you're supposed to is a good way of keeping your heart on the uh, right track. And if you think about like, the way that our eyes are actually a part of our brain, because that goes right into your brain through the optic nerve from your eye. It's actually a part of your brain. Uh, so if you get the eyes pointed right, the rest of your mind will follow, ideally. Uh, but so he... And it's interesting that they focus, he focuses on the eyes. He doesn't focus on, you know, like your neck or your hands. It's... Uh, it's the eyes because the the looking isn't that how we first start to go down the wrong path is the things we see and then he continues praying for a revival you know, uh, establish your word as that which produces reverence for you and turn away my reproach which I dread for your ordinances are good and I long for your precepts, revise me through your righteousness. Um, I don't know, this is kind of a funny observation, but it's, it's nobody ever, no, they never ever pray for God to like change his law, right? It's always about help us to keep your law. No one ever says, you know, could you lighten up on this maybe? I don't know. We do that to it, you know, you know, and a society will do that. You know, even well-meaning Christians are like, well, you know, that's what that meant back then, but things are different now. That doesn't really apply to us. And it's like, okay, and yeah, it kind, kind of does a little bit, yeah. Uh, but we, you can't pick and choose. What's funny is sometimes, you know, people will, will try to whitewash or downplay the Ten Commandments but those same people, kind of being a little self-righteous, love to go back to the ceremonial law in the Old Testament like that's something we have to do too. It's like, oh yeah, well you know, you know a woman can't go out without covering her head. It's like, ceremonial law that doesn't apply to us. Like, if you're going to do that, you're not allowed to eat shrimp either or bacon. But they love to point out to that stuff in the Old Testament because by somehow keeping some of those ceremonial laws, well, I'm a good Christian. I'm like, no, that, none of that applies to you. That's what... Paul is railing about in a lot of his epistles about mixing the old Jewish ways with the new Christian ways. It's like, so yeah, we do try to twist God's law to our own, our own desires. And you figure as, you know, a Pharisee, and he would be the last person that would want to diverge from the tradition and the old law. Yeah. That's what I always found fascinating. Yeah, and then, you know, the Pharisees you know, were so blind that they made up all of this other law to try to keep the commandments and wound up not keeping the commandments and were utterly blind to it. That, that's what their hypocrisy was. Was, okay, look at what I do by my actions, you know, how pious a guy I am. Uh, but the reality is, if they only would admit that they were sinners, you know, they actually thought they were sinless. I, don't, I think they outwardly thought they were sinless. I think deep down inside they knew. I don't know. Uh, it just hard, kind of feels hard to believe that they could be that dense, but on the other hand, so are we. I mean, people don't change. 
human nature doesn't change. When you go to the one passage where Jesus was talking about the Pharisee and the uh, one beggar, the Pharisee says, I'm glad I'm not like this man. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's so one of my. They obviously think themselves better than anybody else, and the other man wouldn't even so much as look up to have it. Mm hmm. Yes, that's one of my favorite ones because that kind of really drives the point home. So, oh Lord, you know, thank God I'm not like that guy. Can you all see? See, everybody, I'm praying loud and I'm glad I'm not like that guy. And I'm not a sinner, okay? Well, we do that with the, the Ten Commandments too. You know, we look at it and we go, well, we don't steal from anybody or we don't right. kill anybody. Right. You know, but there's so much more than the that yeah. the Ten Commandments mean. Yeah, I mean, and then there's, you know, anytime there's a commandment that says thou shalt not, there is something in there that says thou shall. There, there's always a thou shall mm -hmm. unspoken that's there that, okay, this is what you're supposed to be doing and you ain't doing it. Uh, but yeah, people turn that, people twist that to their own advantage too. It's like, I've never killed anybody. Well, have you ever hurt anybody or harmed anybody or by your action or inaction caused someone to come to harm? Then that's the same thing as killing. That's, you know, so. Uh, you can say something to the person. Your tongue can be very delicate. to people. Right. Right, absolutely. Um, or, uh, uh, Wow, my train of thought still boarding at the station tonight. What, what are you going to say? Oh, yeah, just, yeah. We like to dilute the law for our own benefit. It's like, okay, so we'll make it super literal when it's applied to us. When it's applied to somebody else, not so much. And that's, that's where our hypocrisy comes from. And that's probably, that's probably, we'll stop there for tonight. It's almost 8.30 already. Uh, but I, think, I think we should keep looking at that throughout this psalm. Is that I, I don't think this is any profound new insight, this pattern I've seen that kind of matches our liturgy, but uh, I think it's kind of neat. And I'm sure i got to look for that. I'm sure, obviously, somebody else has commented or written something about that. I'll try to find it. Yeah, oh, it was interesting because uh, daily prayer today, the, it was one of the imprecatory psalms, was our daily prayer. It's like, oh boy, I'm going to put this out there on YouTube. It's like, I don't know what he was talking about, but he was talking about knocking out his enemy's teeth and he hoped that he would uh, dissolve like a slug or, or uh, die like a stillborn child that never had a chance to live. I, I don't, why is he doing that? <laughs> it's like, oh boy, that was one of the rough ones yeah I prayed that our enemies get their teeth knocked out it's not Christian yeah I think we'll I think we'll stop there tonight Here's a neat, just another Hebraism, and I'll, I will um, stop talking. Let's see, 33. Uh, Instruct me, Lord, in the way of your statutes that I may keep it without fail. This is neat. Um, he says that, this is Alter's commentary, he says that the Hebrew word ekev has puzzled interpreters. As a noun, it means heel, like the heel of your foot. Uh, as a subordinate conjunction, it means because or in consequence, probably because the heel is an image of following after something. Uh, the word appears here to serve as an adverb, so it might have the sense of acting consequentially or without fail. So, instruct me, Lord, in the way of your statutes that I may follow them. So that this word that can be translated, you see, I don't know how people translate Hebrew into English. When you see if they do it literally, it's like, how do they get what's in here from that? It's, I don't get that. But apparently it's very easy to begin learning Hebrew. Uh, and then it's, 
they, well, they say it's hard at first because it's a different alphabet, and then it's easy, and then it's like crazy hard because nothing is what it seems. It's, I don't know. But that's interesting that that without fail means to be that image of following because you're walking behind or walking, walking kind of in the same footsteps as somebody else. So that's kind of neat. Uh, questions or comments tonight? Okay. Uh, then we will uh, join together in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen.